Charles Darwin is most famous for his model of evolution by natural selection, which he first started to formulate as a very young man. And after he presented his arguments and evidence in support of natural selection with remarkable clarity, he continued to champion his ideas for the remainder of his life with great thoughtfulness and almost always going way overboard in supporting his best thoughts with way more evidence than what was necessary. It was kind of like his trademark. But there were some times in which Darwin offered up some ideas that, in the light of what we know today, they just seem kind of goofy. And one of Darwin's odder suggestions was in relation to the angiosperm's rapid rise. And he speculated that perhaps flowering plants had their evolutionary origin and completed a large amount of their diversification on an unknown continent that's now under the ocean, kind of like the lost civilization of Atlantis. And just before their sudden appearance in the fossil record, they were able to spread to the rest of the Earth's land areas, and sometime later their home world got swallowed up by the sea. Of course, this was just idle speculation, and there's absolutely no evidence for any of this. There is, however, a line of reasoning that could trace the lineage of seed plants leading up to the angiosperms, as having gone through a history of adapting initially to drier, harsher conditions, before returning to the wetter habitats where you first find them in the early Cretaceous. Once the angiosperms reappear in the fossil record, then we can see them rapidly coming to dominance, initially in the tropics, and then spreading polewards. What I'm going to show you here is a sequence of stills from Professor Scotese's website focusing on paleoclimate. Now in the first part of this narrative, we're acknowledging that through this period in which the angiosperm ancestors were MIA, the world's land areas got extremely dry. Here we start in the late Carboniferous, and you can see a narrow band of tropical, ever-wet forests that were home to the giant ferns and lycophytes. And then as we progress into the Permian, lower and then middle and upper, those ever-wet equatorial forests just dry up and are replaced by an equatorial desert. You still have coal forests in the areas off the main supercontinent, but look what happens when we move into the Triassic. Lower Triassic, Middle Triassic, things just get very, very dry. The middle area of the supercontinent would have been largely uninhabitable. Now some of the areas that are close enough to the coasts would have experienced seasonal monsoons with extreme wet and dry periods, and this would also have required the plants to deal with extensive periods of drought. Now dealing with dry conditions is the area where seed plants had a significant advantage over the non-seeding plants like the lycophytes and the ferns, which had been dominant prior to this long dry period. Now if you look at some of the modern conifers and nidophytes, we see that they're successful in the drier places on the earth, and they're also the ones that evolved characteristics in parallel with the angiosperms, pollen tubes, and maybe even double fertilization. Now to the extent that these changes in these gymnosperms in particular help them adapt to the drier, harsher conditions, one could interpret the evolution of those same characteristics in flowering plants as having been due to similar selective pressures. Basically, the angiosperms must have also been evolving in response to challenges presented by the drier environment. Now angiosperms go one step further. Uh, we also see vessel elements in their xylem, which are generally taken to be an improvement for the plant's ability to take up water. In comparison, they have an advantage over all the gymnosperms, which are limited by only having tracheids to transport water around the plant. The bottom line here is that even though we don't have fossils of the plants that made the transition from early seed plant to angiosperm, we do see some rather tantalizing signs of adaptation to dry conditions, even though they're living under wet conditions when we lose track of them in the Carboniferous, and they're in wet conditions when we pick them up again in the Cretaceous. Now truly and honestly, there's no completely acceptable rationale for us not to have any traces whatsoever of angiosperm-related plants during that long period of Permian, Triassic, and Jurassic. They should have at least been leaving pollen that could be picked up in the sediment cores. It could very well be the case that their pollen is there, and we just haven't figured out how to recognize it from all the pollen of all the other seed plants that's found there. But if the home world of angiosperms during this time were in the driest parts of the world, well, think about it. One, there wouldn't be very much biomass produced because it was so dry. And two, the conditions for fossilization would be extremely poor, 
So if there is a place for angiosperms to have hidden out for 180 million years without leaving fossils, the dry continental interior areas would seem like the most likely candidate. Like Darwin's lost continent, however, this hypothesis is without any direct evidence. It is supported only from the lack of fossils and also from these apparently drought-related characteristics that are shared by all angiosperms. Now back to our map. Moving into the Upper Triassic, uh, we start to see the breakup of Pangaea that continues on through the Jurassic. Lower Jurassic, Upper Jurassic. The wet equatorial tropical zone is, is basically getting reestablished. And you can start seeing bauxites, which are an indicator of wet tropical climates in this area right here. By the time we get to the Cretaceous, the earliest angiosperm fossils are popping up in places like Portugal and northern Africa. And there's all kinds of evidence supporting that those areas were both tropical and also very wet. So, could those angiosperm progenitors have been there all along, but in the drier areas, such as the margins between the uninhabitable interior deserts and the areas that were affected by the monsoons? Now, the plants that would have adapted to those conditions would need to have been very fast growing and able to take up available water very quickly and also reach maturity very quickly. And it's here where we pick up the trail again with fossils, with the evidence supported part of the story that starts with the earliest angiosperms. In 2004, Field et al., and this is how he spells his name, I didn't make a mistake, presented a rationale for understanding the earliest angiosperms as living under dark and disturbed conditions. The evidence supporting this model is two-pronged. First, the fossils of the earliest angiosperms showed that they're relatively small plants with broad leaves and they had small seeds with thin walls. Now this is very Sherlock Holmesy, but it does make a lot of sense. If you go out today and look in areas of intense sun, you're not going to find plants with large flat leaves. And this is because A, living in bright light, you don't need all that surface area. And B, having a big broad leaf is going to give you a tendency to heat up very quickly and it puts a plant at risk of excessive water loss. Now under these conditions, smaller leaves will provide adequate surface area and they cool more effectively by convection. On the other hand, in lower light habitats, for example, under a forest canopy. You actually do find these broader flat leaves like we're seeing here. Under these shaded conditions, having a very large surface area will allow for the greatest uptake of solar energy. And there's also very little risk of overheating. Now, small thin-walled seeds, they're good for dispersing longer distances. And this is going to be necessary for those plants that are going to specialize in colonizing disturbed habitats like an area that's been plowed up, uh, maybe because a couple of dinosaurs were having a fight in a forest. Okay? There's a lot of dirt, maybe a little bit less shade, um, and it might be ideal conditions for a certain type of plant that's able to come in, grow very quickly, and reach maturity. Now, within a couple of years, that area is going to close back up. It's going to return to the forest that it was before. In other words, giving less than ideal conditions for those plants that we're colonizing. So those plants that are colonizing those disturbed areas, they've got to send their seeds long distances, giving them the best chance to be successful in finding a new forest disturbance in which they can grow. The second bit of evidence used by field comes from those flowering plants living today that we recognize as most basal. That is, having branched away from the rest of the angiosperms, the earliest, and are therefore more likely to have the characteristics of the primeval angiosperms. The plants of the basal part of the angiosperm tree of life include three orders, the Amborales, the Nymphiales, and the Austrobaliales. And we often refer to these as the ANA grade, or sometimes the Anita grade of flowering plants. Field noted that these plants, and he also included the Chloranthales, which is both basal and abundant in early angiosperm fossils. These plants generally do specialize in dark and disturbed habitats. So now this is as good a time as any for us to talk about these early plants, the basal plants in the evolutionary tree of life of angiosperms. Right here at the very base of the tree, we've got the earliest split. This is a common ancestor to all angiosperms living and extinct. And the earliest split gives rise to the lineage that leads up to Amborella trichopita. Okay. Um, 
What does it look like? Well, this is a selfie that I took at the University of California Botanical Gardens with the Amborella plant. They only have one plant in the whole gardens. It's in a pot, and I was able to take this selfie. Yeah. So anyways, Amborella is an obscure, slow-growing plant. It lives only in a few spots on the island of New Caledonia, which is in the South Pacific. And despite its rather humble appearance, Amborella is actually a very remarkable plant and of great importance for our understanding of flowering and plant origins. And we'll definitely be coming back to this guy. So the second note here is the one leading to the Nymphaeales, for which I've just given the whole order of the Nymphaeales at the very top. It's a pretty big order. Uh, water lilies include really uh, pretty things like this. Yay, how nice. And also other things like this plant, Victoria Amazonica, which is the uh, largest of all water lilies. It's native to the Pantanas of the Amazon drainage. And so we've got Amborella and the Nymphaeales as the two most basal of the angiosperm groups. And the third group that splits off is the Austrobaleales, and it's comprised mostly of woody shrubs and vines of the tropical understory. Now there aren't uh, really any plants of great importance in this group. There's Elysium verum, which is the star anise. It's uh, commonly used in licorice flavoring. Um, not to be confused with the true anise, which is actually the, the seeds of the fennel plant. And there's also a plant in the, I think it's in the Trimeni ACE, which is the Shisandra plant. Uh, in Chinese medicine, there's this thing called Wu Weizi, uh, sometimes called five flavor berry that's used in Chinese herbal medicine. So they've got a picture here of Elysium, also from the University of California Botanical Gardens. This is Elysium lanceolatum. I think it's native to China or Florida, one of those. And, uh, and again, it's not, these aren't extraordinarily exciting plants, but they do have some pretty significant importance when you think about their overall placement. These are kind of like the most basal, the most primitive of all the flowering plants. Now, Amborella and also most of these Australialis, they're most associated with Southern Asia and Australia, and their ecologies today are perfectly consistent with the dark and disturbed model presented by Field. Now, water lilies took on an aquatic habitat very early in the angiosperm history. They're distributed worldwide, and they've undergone diversifications after their split away from the rest of the flowering plants. And in fact, the oldest angiosperm megafossil, I showed you this last time, Archifructus, it's been placed within the Nymphaeales. It's basically a water lily. Now, after the splitting off of Amborella, the Nymphaeales, and the Ostrobaleales, the one lineage we're left with here is the one leading up to the Mesangiospermi, the main group of flowering plants, including avocados and grasses and daisies. Now, timing-wise, we suspect that the mesangiospermy began to diversify in the earliest part of the Cretaceous, right? And so these earlier splits, the ones that gave rise to the ANA-grade plants, they must have taken their origins before that, very likely in the Jurassic, but conceivably as early as the Jurassic, or possibly even the Permian. The third part of this narrative is the angiosperm's poleward expansion into temperate latitudes from an origin of the equatorial tropics. The fossil record shows a very nice sequence in which the earliest angiosperms start nearer the equator, and they later spread successfully both in the north and south directions. Even now, we find the greatest diversity and the highest domination by flowering plants in the tropics, while in the higher latitudes you find greater abundances of gymnosperms. After this initial expansion from the tropics, some angiosperms group underwent their own radiations from epicenters originating in the higher latitudes. And this is why we have so many kinds of flowering plants that are abundant and diverse, yet distributed only within a geographic range either in the northern or the southern hemisphere. Now this narrative is not the definitive history of pre-angiosperms. It's certainly more plausible than Darwin's lost continent, but only in that it's consistent with our observations of fossils and extant plants, together with what we learned about paleoclimate from those reconstructions of continental configurations coupled with climate models. Now, there must have been some influences to early flowering plant evolution presented by dinosaurs. We've already talked a little bit about dinosaurs having a role in creating the disturbances in forest habitats that contributed to the flourishing of early angiosperms. 
But dinosaurs were also herbivores, and they must have had large appetites, and this would have been an important challenge for all plants, including the early angiosperms. It's tempting to see the rise of flowering plants, coupled with the demise of non-avian dinosaurs, as being somehow linked. Maybe angiosperms came into domination because of their higher state of evolved defenses against dinosaur herbivory, and thus it may have been dinosaurs that really invited flowering plants to the party, not only by creating disturbances, but also by eating up all the competitors. But alas, there's no evidence for this idea either. Insects, on the other hand, are far stronger as candidates to have driven the Cretaceous angiosperm radiation. By the end of the Jurassic, insects had already achieved great diversity both in the number of higher level taxa like orders and families, as well as in their modes of ecology. Herbivorous insects included those that chewed plant material, those that sucked fluids, some mined through the leaves, some formed galls, and others ate pollen. There were also predatory and parasitoid insects that fed on the herbivorous insects, and the early flowering plants were coming of age during a time in which this varied array of insect-related challenges was already in place. Insect herbivores are small enough to form specialist association with particular plant species, and this can lead to a form of coevolution and co-speciation that ties a plant lineage with a cadre of insect species that are dependent on the plant, while they continually put pressure on the plant to minimize the damage that they cause. If you add to this, the opportunities for flowering plants to form specific associations with insect pollinators which was largely a new niche that opened up with the beginnings of angiosperms, it seems very reasonable that plants and insects could have engaged in a sort of mutually co-evolved diversification during the Cretaceous and beyond. Now this insect-driven model predicts that increases in insect diversity should be about synchronized with those pulses of diversification seen in plants. This prediction is actually very hard to assess because insects don't fossilize well at all and much of the insect fossil record is dependent on Lagerstätte, which are a small handful of sites in which you can find really large numbers of insect fossils because these sites happen to provide exactly the right conditions for insect preservation. Each Lagerstadt provides a huge number of new insect forms, and so it ends up looking like the insects have huge increases in and around the times documented by the Lagerstätte, and this is not going to give us an accurate depiction of their actual diversification histories. In summary, we've continued to develop the picture of the conditions surrounding the stunning radiation of angiosperms, beginning probably in the Jurassic with the departure of the three lineages, giving rise to the ANA grade. Now with a re-wetting of the tropics, the earliest angiosperms may have come onto the scene as successful colonators of shady, disturbed habitats. Dinosaurs may very well have been major factors in creating small clearings in the forests, but it seems unlikely that their herbivory was an important factor in promoting the diversification of angiosperms. It's far more likely that coevolution with insect herbivores and insect pollinators was a driving force, maybe the driving force, for the rapid evolution of angiosperms as well as insect diversification.